All right, we're ready to call the meeting to order. It's uh, 7.02. And uh, can I get a motion to open the meeting? So moved. All right, so first thing on the agenda as far as just doing a quick roll call, it's just for Alicia. Alicia, you're on, right? Yes, I'm here. Yep, um, so we got myself, Rick Murray, um, Brian Kelly, Howie Kuchenberg, um, Craig Rosenquist, Stephen Moan, Dave Friedman, and I don't believe we have Tucker. Tucker, if you're here, let us know. How about Dave Healy? Dave Haley, um, and then Steve Garb. Steve, you there? Okay, so we get those three that aren't there, and Dave Sinkowski could not make the meeting tonight, Alicia as well, so, okay. All right, first order of business is really the, uh, was acceptance of the agenda. Do I have a motion to accept the agenda? So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Um, and then the next item is really the acceptance of the meeting from the September meeting. And after some last minute kind of uh, edits that had just come in tonight, I think what we would decide to do is, Brian, you said you were going to try to take a crack at fixing a couple of those items. Exactly. So I, if, uh, if there's no objections, uh, I'd like to make a motion to suspend the acceptance of the last month's meetings, hold off until the following month, and uh, I will send it out to everybody with some of my corrections and edits, and uh, people can chime in accordingly, and then we can uh, do a, a, a double header next month, except uh, last month and this current month, if uh, if everybody's in agreement. so. If I could make a motion to uh, delay the acceptance of last month's meetings on minutes rather until next month. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. But David Daphne, you don't count. <laughs> so Not yet. <laughs> Alicia, that was unanimous. Yep. <laughs> All right, so we're good with that. Um, yeah, there's some last minute stuff that came in. So instead of spending 15 minutes going through a couple bunch of different edit things, we said, let's just get it done so that it's ready for the next meeting instead of uh, holding everyone up tonight. So next item uh, on the agenda is the Harbor Masters Report by Mr. Stephen Moan. Steve, it's all you. So um, the first thing is the update on the uh, new boat delivery. Um, the um, I, I spoke to Stuart Workman. He's the builder up in Maine. And um, the big holdup is still the windows, but he, he feels fairly confident that the windows will be delivered by the end of this month um, so that we should be receiving the boat sometime in the the first week of December. Um, so that's where we stand with the boat. I sent out, I think I sent him, uh, Mike, you some pictures of the lettering on the boat. Yeah, I did see that. Yeah. 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 Um, the boat is, is coming out really nice. Uh, they're doing a great job up there. And um, it, it's just the windows that have the hold up right now. So they don't even think they're going to have the windows to the end of the month, end of November. Yeah, it, it, but it shouldn't. It shouldn't take you know a day to put the windows in, because they're all, everything's all cut out and they're all made to size, and they're all in aluminum frames. So they just you know uh, put some sealant in and then fasten them to the house. Okay. Steve, and the plan is to take delivery in December. 
That that is what that that's what he's uh, talking about right now. Yes. Ride. Wrapped in a package with a bow on it. I guess so. <laughs> so that's where we stand on the boat. Uh, anybody have any questions on that? Yeah, I just have one, one question. It just seems like it continues to slip with regards to these windows. And I know they're, they're back ordered, but um, it's a little bit concerning that we're now looking at another full month and we're not even originally we were supposed to take delivery of this boat in July, right? <clears throat> yeah. And now we're already out to December of it. So I just hope yeah. that they stick to that. And as far as bringing it down, is it is still the plan to bring it down on its bottom or is it to trailer it down? Uh, we, he and I had discussions about whether we um, bring it down on its bottom, which would be a two day trip. He, Said, suggested if we did go on its own bottom to tuck into um, Booth, um, to, I think he said Booth Bay. Yeah. And the, it's just north the, the it's just north of Portland, and then um, the second day run to Situate, or he could take the mass down and we could bring it <clears throat> bring it over the road. Okay. Yeah. So there's an option for either way on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Is there, a, is, there a, is there a delivery charge? Uh, I'm trying to. I'm trying. I've been reading the contract to find out if he was delivering it or if we were picking it up. So okay. that's something I've been looking through. But I've been pretty busy working on the marina. You know, the past few days or the past two weeks, actually. So I'm just trying to get the marina broken down and put away. Okay. Any other questions from the group or the audience on the boat? Yes, yeah, Stephen, this is Dave Friedman. Is there any benefit to taking it in December or just waiting till April when we could nicely drive it down? Well, I, I think we we want to get it here so that it can get over to Boatworks. Boatworks is going to be installing the fire pump. Oh, yeah. So we'd want it here um, so that Boatworks can get to work on the fire pump. Got it. There also could be an issue, at least from a financial point of view, in the sense that uh, we're accruing interest, um, so delaying delivery of it till April might cause some type of triggering event where we may have to incur additional insurance charges to store it up there. I'm just speaking uh, out loud on this one. I don't know, but that, if that was something to consider, we'd have to have obviously Nancy and look at, look into this. Yeah, I'm guessing SW wants to. Um... They get want to get paid. <laughs> yeah, they want to get it delivered to us, I'm sure, so they can get paid for it. So, um, yeah, correct. You might want to look at something. If you can't run it down at its bottom, you might want to look at some sort of possible holdback or some sort of um, thing so that everything's good when you get a chance to run it in the spring, right? Yeah, I, they would be running it up there anyways. They have to do it sea trials. That's yeah. part of uh, it. So even if it, even if it came down here, it would still have to be sea trialed up there. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Understood. One thought, uh, One thought. Brad White here. Uh, Stephen, if you did a combination of a uh, immediate delivery, but not used till April, March, April, maybe you could ask them because of their tardiness and understandably so because of COVID and all that, but to not start your warranty until like April, because you're gonna pick up four or five months on boat warranties. Just a thought, wouldn't hurt to ask. It doesn't cost anything to ask and uh, you protect yourself on the uh, non-used months. That's Thank fine, you. I can ask that. All right, Very good. Moving along here, um, Stephen, can you update us on the piling project? Yeah, we've been kind of, uh, we had a meeting about two weeks ago with the contractor on site 
um, or two and a half weeks ago, I was with Sean McCarthy, Paul Scott, myself, the contractor, and also the subcontractor that's going to be doing the uh, repair to the riprap and repair to the um, the the seawall itself, uh, where the gangway is going to go. And their plan was to start to do some of the work from um, from the land, you know, with a crane. And they have some concerns whether they can get the crane over close enough to get to that or whether they're going to have to use a, a crane from a barge. Uh, and that would be to remove the existing pier and to put the rock at, you know, the riprap rocks in place. Um, I got a letter today from the uh, contractor. He plans on setting up the fencing and start to take delivery of the materials, I believe in two weeks, is what is what the um, email said. And the um, materials would be stored in Cole Parkway just beyond the bandstand in a fenced in area. So he's having some fencing set up. Um, so that's where we stand on the project. And like I said, the project has a finish date of May 14th. So he has between now and then to complete the project. Um, also, I made arrangements with uh, the crane a crane company here and with uh, safe board safe, who is the um, the gangway manufacturer, and we we contracted directly with board safe, and we're hoping to have the gangway delivered next week, and that would also be stored at Cole Parkway in that same area. So that's where we stand right now with the project. What what is Board Safe? Board Safe is just an aluminum manufacturer. That's the name of the company. Oh, okay. They're, yeah. they're make they're building the gang or they've built the gangway. That we just have it in storage. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah, gotcha. But we bought it direct. The contractor did not buy that. We bought it directly from them. Right. Yeah. From Board Safe. Yeah. Okay. From Board Safe. Yeah. So sure. that's where we stand on the piling project. Uh, does have, anybody have any questions? Stephen, when do you think he'll start actually driving the piles? And, and can that happen right through the winter? It can, uh, but it is completely up to the contractor. Like I said, he has until May 14th to complete the project. Uh, I believe he's going to start in the late winter, early spring in driving piles, but that could change next week as well. We, we're, right. we're just I mean, there are, are there the restrictions for flounder and all that stuff? For what? Like flounder and, you know, similar no, like uh, no. dredging. No, we have no, we have no restrictions. Okay, great. Yeah, it's not like a dredge project where uh, you, you have the winter flounder restrictions. All right, so his clock is ticking. His clock is ticking. All right, any other questions from the from the group or from the audience on that project? <laughs> yeah, I know. I guess guess that's not no. Nope. All right, uh, parking lot lights at Jericho. Yeah, I've been kind of. Um, Going back and forth between na um, National Grid and um, Fishing and Boating Access. Um, fishing and Boating Access is willing to provide or pay for the lighting, for the lights. Um, but they're looking to the town to pay for the electric bill. Um, so I'm, it, I've been, I got this information about a week ago, I think I copied you on it, Brian, as well, and how, and uh, I mean, um, Mike and Brian. The emails going back and forth between National Grid and myself and Fishing and Boating Access. 
Um, we're just trying to find out what is going to be the cost. Um, I did go down and I found a meter. So we're actually going to find out who's paying the bill now. Um, and I've sent that out to National Grid to find out who's paying that bill now. But as it stands, the state doesn't have accounts to pay for that. So I believe the town has been paying it. Um, and I just have to verify that that is okay to continue if that is the case. Well, I would imagine it must have been the town that was paying it before, right? Yeah, I, I have not seen that bill. You know, I pay the electric bills for uh, our building, for, for the dock, for the Maritime Center, for the dock at the Maritime Center, and then I pay the electric bill for the town pier as well. But uh, I have not, I asked Ellen, and I have not seen, or we have not been receiving a bill for Jericho. That we can identify. Are you talking about the lights that are the decorative lights? Yeah, those were, the decorative lights were the only lights in that parking lot. Yeah, okay. All right, now, and you're talking about putting they were, lights, you're talking about putting lights were, up on the utility poles, right? Yeah, the decorative lights have been removed because they were rotted out and there was concern. Um, we had gotten a call from some residents, so I had reached out to Fishing and Boating Access to have them look into the lights. They went down and saw them, and then they had their contractor remove them because they were concerned as well that they could possibly fall over, which left the boat ramp um, parking area somewhat in the dark. I mean, those decorative lights did not give off a lot of light, but there was, they definitely give off some light. Yeah. So we're looking to put some, we're looking to put some lights up on the poles yeah, uh, until, until those, dec until those lights are replaced. Yeah. Okay. So put lights up on the pole or just a monthly fee from National Grid. Correct. Yeah, okay. And if we buy, if either we buy the fixtures themselves or if we, or if fishing and boating access buys the fixtures or provides them, or if we rent the fixtures from National Grid, it, it just depends on how it's done. And I'm, I've been trying, the, the woman I've been dealing with at National Grid is um, deployed in another area of the country working on hurricane, you know, some hurricane damage areas is the email that I've been receiving. Okay. okay so you're working on that so that'll stay kind of on just to keep us updated on that, Stephen. Yes, I will. Yeah. Mike, can I add to that? Dave Goffney here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, just uh, Dave Doffney, 356 Clap Road. Um, the, the light that I rent for my shop is about $30 a month and they own the fixture. So it's, it's not a, it's not a huge amount of money and it's uh photo sensitive. So it comes on and off automatically. So, um, I, I couldn't imagine it'd be more than a hundred dollars through the winter per month for, for lights there, but it's not an exorbitant amount. Right. And we think that we're not even sure it's really going to fall under waterways, right? Because it's what was there before. Correct. It, so that that's what I'm trying to determine. Yeah. Okay. A few, a few, if I could, a few years back, the town took over from National Grid all the street lights in town. So as you saw, a lot of the, the lights were changed to LED lighting. The the town took over all the all the roads, uh, minus I believe like three A, one twenty three state highways. <laughs> So they may, in fact, already be paying the bill for the electricity in that parking lot where it's coming off the poles. But if you put up street lights or, uh, you know, similar to the road, it, it could be the town would just pay that bill along with the rest of the roads they're already doing. Yeah, that would make Correct. sense. Correct. And that, that's just what we're trying to determine. Yeah. Yeah, the, the one thing that, that those lights would be pointing to the parking lot and not along the roadways. So they're probably um, a different category. Correct. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I just think in principle, we don't want to get in the business of owning and running streetlights. We own all the streetlights in town now. No, but I mean waterways. Water, I think he means waterways. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we just want to add it on to what the town's already doing. Is uh, If I'm understanding you right, we just want to add it on to what they're doing. We don't want to have that on waterways and be paying those bills too. So. We should bring it to the town's attention. Yeah. Then work it out with the state. Mm -hmm. Walk away. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, great. Next item, unless some, someone else has comments on that. Season wrap-up um, notes, Stephen? Yeah, so we had an extremely busy season this year. Um, our boat stops were almost double what they were last year. Um, we had, I, I think the number was about um, 20 rescues, I, I think is what I was told um, by the end of the season. So. We were really busy, but we had a, a great season all in all. Um, I got uh, I, I got a lot of compliments from residents, and um, actually I got some compliments from a couple of the commercial fishermen about how my staff interact with everyone. Um, and one of them was actually today where one of the commercial fishermen came up to me, and he said that um, one of our patrol boats, he was just outside the jetty and he was stopped and the patrol boat pulled over and just asked if he was okay or if he needed anything. And he thought that was, you know, really great of them. Um, and that they went over to just check, even though he was a commercial guy that, you know, a lot of people just see out there and just assume they're, they're all set. Um, so he was pretty happy with that. So all in all, we had a great season. Um, I was very happy with my staff this year. Uh, the maintenance crew did a great job uh, with the pump outs. Uh, we, we were right on top of it um, all year long. Uh, the pump out station itself, uh, we had one issue in the middle of the summer where the, one of the push buttons stopped working, so we got the electrician out. He came out the next day in the morning, made the repair to that, and we were back up and running. Um, so all in all, it was a great season. We're in the midst of breaking down the marinas. We've bundled all the fingers over at the Maritime Center uh, for the winter, and they're all tied off and chained up. And we're breaking down Cole Parkway. We were moving docks across the way today. Um, to get them situated and we're in the process of just trying to get, you know, it all put away and ready to go for the winter time and turn it over to the contractor that side as well. So uh, all in all, it was a, a really good year. Good. Um, I had one qu question. Do you keep stats on number of pump outs? Um, you know, that you guys have done with the boat or is that something you yeah, guys we, track of? We actually, um, we build um, the clean, uh, CVA, Clean Vessel Act, yep. for the staff hours and for the gallons of, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. so it's done by hours and gallonage. And oh. boat, uh, either boat name or MS number, or just the type of boat. If there's no name or M, you know, if, if it's a, a sailboat that doesn't have a motor, that's, you know, maybe documented. And you, for whatever reason, we can't yeah. identify it. Understood. Yeah. You, I, wasn't sure if you, I wasn't sure if you tracked and said, "Oh, we pumped out, you know, 300 boats this year." And then, if that's something that's not a metric you guys track, so. No, it, it, we we just we we keep track of it because that's how we get reimbursed for it. Yeah, and then we just submit it to the state or uh, to CBA, and they provide us with you know the funding. For, we get paid back eighty percent of everything we spend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we charge for dockage for the boat. Uh, we charge for the you know, the location we charge, you know, 
uh, for our staff that's out there. So um, if the maintenance kids are working, we charge them for the day if they're out doing pump outs. And if, they, if they're painting something and they get a pump out call, they're supposed to drop what they're doing and go pump out the boat and then come back in and, and pick up kind of where they left off. Yeah, understood. Yeah, okay. Any anyone have any questions or comments regarding season wrap up for Stephen? All right, I'll take that as a no. Um, the next item we have on the agenda is really the capital items for 2022. And I know just today um, Brian had come to me with a couple. Um, Updates. I, ca I caught some emails back and forth. So, Brian, I don't know if you want to talk to that yourself or you want Stephen to comment on the capital plan. We can move that down to the new business where, where it's already on the agenda. So, since Stephen is uh, um, not on a video and it's pretty simple and quick, what I had sent out to everybody, hey guys, if I can do this, there we go. I think we have Moan on the phone, not like Elf on a Shelf, but. I'll leave that alone. Moan on the phone. <laughs> oh, very nice. The <laughs> Stephen's budget um, for uh, FY22. So we're in FY21. Um, so this would have to go through the approval process. Stephen has met with the TA and Nancy, um, and uh, the only two items that are on it for FY22, which begins next July 1, is $200,000 for replacement of the docks and gangways. And that's <laughs> uh, an attempt to get the a seaport grant to replace all the docks at uh, Cole Parkway. So step one to get the grant is first to have the approval of the monies uh, by the town. So when seaport asks, do you have the money? allocated and approved, we can respond yes. So that's uh, a placeholder for that exact uh, item. However, it is not obviously anywhere nearly the amount that would be required to replace all the docks, gangways at Cole Parkway. Um, the estimates on that are TBD. They range anywhere from 700 to a million, 700,000 to a million. The other much more uh, digestible number is the repower of unit one for 47,000. So that's a total of $247,000 in capital fair play 22, which next has to go to capital planning, then advisory, then the board of selectmen, and then it gets put on uh, for the town meeting. So uh, I plan on taking these numbers and then inputting them into our projections, but these numbers are pretty much hot off the press, right, Stephen? They came out yesterday? Yes, they are. Yep, and that that's my um, those are my two capital plan budget items for this year. Okay, so wait. Brian, for Stephen, what what, ha what happened to the pump out station at Jericho Boat Ramp? We push it out to next year. Okay, all right. That was on the email that I think yeah. Brian sent. Us. Yeah, that that was I, I I reached out to Brian because there was a lot of emails going back and forth, and uh, I believe Brian was getting some emails. We get a lot of emails from Nancy that are in a PDF style. So I, I think it was just when he was filling it out, he probably looked at another piece of paper. Yeah, and that actually was originally on FY22, but it dropped down to FY23 and one of the subsequent documents that were generated and, and uh, put out in the past 48, 72 hours. Gotcha. Just can I ask a question about that? Pump, you know, I know we talked a little bit about this historically, um, but would we have to get involved with the state there to use part of their ramp to put the uh, pump out station there? The pump out station would, uh, if it was to go anywhere, it would go on one of the floats down on the dock itself at the ramp. Right, but those are owned by the state, right? Yeah, so, and, and CVA is also a state entity, and I'm sure fishing and boating access would like clean water so that people can fish. It would um, just impede it, a little bit with the access, right? I mean, yeah, I, getting I, their, 
you know, right. It takes about five like minutes to get. To yeah, it, it takes about five minutes to get pumped out, um, and you know, while you're waiting in queue to, you know, either put your um, pull your boat out of the water or put it in the water, you just run over there and pump it out and get on your merry way. It, it's just another a lo another location in the harbor to do a you know uh, a pump out and for the pump out boats themselves to pump out because if if the coal parkway system failed or went down where you know the whole thing let go we we'd need another location and i'm just trying to you know find another location that makes sense for people to use um and in, you know have a backup plan it would certainly be convenient it would be but the intent if i correct me if i'm wrong steven i don't mean to step on your toes in this but the intent is the cost is would not approach anywhere near what we're budgeting and said this is similar to when we budgeted i believe it was seventy five thousand for a new pump out boat last year yeah. received uh um, fifty six thousand two hundred and fifty dollars so it was a lot our the difference we paid was about you know fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars right so yes you're fall, correct this would fall to a similar scenario but we have to put it in as a whole cost until we know whether or not we would get any type of funding back correct okay okay all right great um so any more discussion on capital plan items or questions before we move on? I'll take that as a no. And we are on to old business here. So back to you, Mr. Steven, for an update on the comprehensive dredge project RFP update. All right. The comprehensive dredge project uh, update for the, on the RFP, that has been put out on the street. Uh, it's been sent out to um, the engineering firms um, that do that type of work, and they ha I believe we we said it was either 30 or 45 days we gave them to respond, um, and that was put out last week. Sean put that, you know, we completed it, and it has been sent out, and we're just going to wait until we get the responses. And then we'll review them, and then we'll grade them, um, and then we'll make a selection. Okay, good. So the RFPs, it's out to bid. Um, they have 30 to 45 days to get back to the town with the, the pricing on it. And uh, it's underway, I guess we'd say. Correct. Yeah. Questions and, and or comments? None. Great. That's good to see that's moved along and it's kind of out as a as a bid now. So it'll be interesting to see how it comes back and what the numbers look like for the whole thing. Great. Mm -hmm. All right. Next item on the agenda is town of situate mooring rentals suggested mooring rules and reg language. Um, we had at the last meeting put together a work group. It was a uh, Rick, Brian, and Brian uh, were the three that were working on that. So uh, I know I did talk to Brian on this a little bit. So if we could just get an update on kind of where where you guys are at with that, and uh, if you want me to share docs or or anything like that. <clears throat> oh. yeah. yeah, Mike. This is uh, Brian Cronin. I, I I sent you something on uh, Saturday. I don't know if you want to. How, how deep you want to get into it? If you want to put it up, um, share your screen if you have it. Um, but I was kind of went for a minimal approach on adding, um, you know, uh, uh, verbiage to the to the the document um, to the mooring regs. Yeah, give me one second. I'll. Uh... Yeah, I didn't. I didn't uh, comment back, Brian Cronin, because. Um, for which I apologize, but I appreciated the approach that you took to get the discussion going. 
because you really just sort of identified a couple outstanding questions and I certainly support starting small. So I think, you know, thanks for getting this going. Brian, would you like me to share my screen on that? Yeah, that'd be great. Oh, not too many things open, huh? Let's try this one. All right, let me know, guys, when you can see the uh, the screen. We see it. We see it. Yeah, you can see it, Mike. Oh, you can't see it. Okay, yeah. yeah. You need me to make it any bigger? Is that legible for you guys? That's yeah, good. That's good? Okay. <clears throat> well, Brian, since you kind of jumped in on this, if you wouldn't mind kind of taking us through kind of uh, what you, you know, some of the proposed changes and what you were thinking. The yes. So I just took your, the document you sent me, I think, I don't know if you or Brian Kelly had put it together um, and simply added just the, the, what was in bold. I think that was what, what you had is um, uh, the, the other than the harb master rending transient moorings. Um, I did take a little bit of uh, down in, in uh, section H, I, I took a little bit of verbiage out of there um, when it came to how to rent a mooring, I figured that that could be covered on the uh, Harbor Master website or the Docwa website. Um, and, and, and also kind of in the uh, operating procedure of, of what, how the moorings are going to be uh, dealt with. Um, as, a, as leaving the fee to be set by the Harbor Master each year, not in the mooring regulations where it's something that uh, would be uh, just more difficult to change. So, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And then I think there was uh, a lot of uh, discussion at the end, uh, or when we were talking last, one of the last meetings, um, and I added, no vessel shall occupy a transient mooring for um, more than seven days in a calendar month. And that was to prevent somebody from circumventing or uh, getting around the, the mooring waiting list and renting the mooring for the entire season. Um, yeah, that makes that was sense. an arbitrary seven days in a calendar month was just something I picked up because it sort of mirrored uh, the seven days when it talked about a club um, renting mooring. So. And I also like the fact that you did not say consecutive or non-consecutive. It's just seven days. Otherwise, you're going to get people going for six and taking off two, going for six, taking off two. So um, I think the seven days in a calendar month is good wording. Yeah, I like that. I've got a question though on that. Should it be a calendar month or a 30 day period? I um, personally. In other words, you come in the last week of the month, Rick. Okay, so let's think devious. Someone comes in June 20th, they could basically get two weeks in a block? Yeah. I think it should be a 30 day period, it's a little more complicated, I suppose. Calendar months easier to track. I agree with that, but I'm just wondering if it's. Yeah. Uh, that is a, it's a good point, Howie. Um, yeah, I think we got to go 30 day period. I can see it both ways. I don't know if we're, you know, how often we're going to see someone trying to do that coming to the end of the month, but it, it could potentially happen end of June coming into July, right? Someone grabbing it for two months. So. Two weeks, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't mean it's complicated, but the way this works. You devious thinker that you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, help me, somebody. Yeah. Um, any other comments from the, the board on that? I, I appreciate, Brian, the work that you've done in this, and I, I'm going to ask you in a second. Yeah. Um, you had a couple of the notes you had forwarded to me. Um, if 
I don't have them handy to pull up in front of me, but if you could just kind of talk about some of those things too, I think it's good for the group to discuss, so. Yeah, I can, I can kind of run through some of them. Yeah. Do you want to have it, then any more comments or do you want me to start just running through them? I don't see anyone else commenting. So if you could just run into that and we'll circle back into this here, I guess. Okay. So these are just some of my thoughts as I was sitting there working on it. Um, in, in not, I don't think that this type of thing should be included in the um, regulations, but it should be kind of in the operations. Um, and, and also kind of our, our approach, um, what we want to do. So it was starting with three moorings and then it's, it's how many are we looking to, um, to have the town manage? Um, and then, then it's what size. Um, yeah. And then, uh, so then it's my approach would be have the three moorings located together and marked with town. So it, it's uh, easy for the, the harbor master on duty can assign them by the radio instead of having to have a patrol boat if the boat's not out to drive the boat to where they are. Um, so. Okay. Yeah, good, good input. So probably all stuff we could add into some sort of kind of operational kind of, uh, you know, once we, once we figure that they do want to rent them and, and, uh, then we would put something into a document, I guess, that would cover, you know, what time they can show up, what the procedures are, all that other stuff, right? And then before we do some of that, maybe we need to cover as a group um, these other things, but where the moorings are, what size they are, and uh, how many, correct? Yeah, and then, yeah, like you said, rented for lunch, check-in, check-out time, whether you can raft, um, and you know, how to pay, you know, whether it's cash or dock. And then um, also one other thing would be um, whether, you know, weather related, uh, are you gonna kick people off on a gale warning or a hurricane? You know, what what's the shut off? So I've been told when I've been out that it's, you know, you had to be out of there for a, on different, different harbors or different morning rentals. They just tell you, you gotta get out if there's a hurricane or a, a possible, High winds coming, so and right. it, those are kind of the other things. And then also, like showers are are they included? And uh, do we need to have more insurance? So those are all good points, and I greatly appreciate not having those in the policy because those are implementation, as per the other points that Brian made. Yeah, yeah that's good. Regarding um, certain aspects of that in terms of an eventual, an eventual implementation plan, I think we should definitely come up with like the number and what they're gonna be colored and location and all that. Regarding storm and other matters, I think we just really need to defer to the Harbor Master on that and probably have some wording that says, um, you know, weather related conditions or weather related occupancies um, somewhere in the policy because this is a policy matter, uh, you know, uh, something about weather or um, uh, that is um, at the discretion of the harbor master or the harbor master has final right or reserves the right to ask for moorings to be vacated, you know, whatever. We have to empower the harbor master to have an option so if he's got to kick somebody out after five days that he can, we don't want to have it that someone's saying, Hey, the policy says I can be here for seven days. It's only day five. I don't care if the entire Harbor's on fire. You can't kick me off. We mm. absolutely have to give the Harbor master the uh, right to uh, safety and uh, everything else. But that's just a one liner if worded right. Yeah. Good point. Um, as far as the, Mooring regulations here. Um, are we at a point where we want to kind of continue this to next week and, and incorporate these changes, or do we want additional discussion tonight and vote tonight? 
I kind of throw it at you guys to see what you say about that. Hmm. I think we should see a uh, final draft yeah. and have a chance to review it as opposed to just looking at it for the first time in the last 15 minutes. And I think we ought to be in a position so that at the next meeting we can vote on it so we can pass it along. Okay. We do need to add that wording and I would suggest that uh, maybe Brian could ask Steve what, Stephen what he thinks would work or something. I, I can't see if we just need to make sure there's a, yeah, you know, the, the harbor master has the right to demand, vac you know, vacating of the mooring at his discretion. Period. You don't want to be too specific, Rick. No, right? that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Just that's right. it. All right, in the interest of time here, can I ask the three of you guys that worked on this to kind of circle back and try to get a, a final draft for next? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it, 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 my only question would be, does uh, that hard, the weather clause need to be in the regulations or could it, could it be in your implementation or operations uh, as a statement? I think it needs to be in the regs. I usually don't want to put things in the regs, but it's got to be up front. It could be in the uh, operating stuff to give examples, but I think we really do need something to yeah, protect the harbor master. You're only talking about a broad statement, Rick, right? And then I agree. creative issues can fall into that other category. Correct. Just a statement that uh, the harbor master has the kind of thinking. Period. Correct. And kind of one other comment is that usually when you rent a slip or somewhere as a transit, usually you have to sign something, you know, acknowledging the rules of that particular marina, right? Um, access, all the, that other stuff and, and safety. I'm almost wondering if that type of stuff should, you know, what do we do today, Stephen, from a, on DACWA when you're renting a slip out? Is there something there that kind of has some policy stuff in there that they have to sign up. That they have to do what? Um, if someone Sorry, is- you broke up. Sure, I'll repeat it. Um, if someone's renting a slip today and let's say they're going through a dock or whatnot, are, are there any, is there anything that they're signing, acknowledging that they need to adhere to certain rules and regulations? I am not 100% sure. I believe there is something when they enter into the contract, but I can check with DACWA. Okay. Yeah. All right. We just could, it would be good to know because that would be the point where you would be letting the transient people coming in know what the rules are, right, Rick? Because otherwise they're not going to know what's in the town's mooring rules and regulations, right? Yeah. But again, just general wording to cover. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. So I'll leave that for you guys. I hate to put it back on you, but if you could do that for the next meeting. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll put something together and bounce it off to Stephen and then get it out to Brian and Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to stop sharing here so I can see what's going on. <clears throat> Any other comments from the audience uh, or from the board regarding that? No, I just want to thank Brian for all his work on this. It's like old, it's old, like old time, Brian. It's like you're back on the waterways. <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Yeah. Small vessel decal study is the next item on the agenda. Other town policies uh, update. So this is the kind of update on the uh, three days. Brian, this is Dave Friedman. Um, Dave Sinkowski really has taken a lot of the lead on this and has been doing the research and obviously he's not here tonight. Um, we haven't met since last meeting, so a little bit of a, of a stall on that, but still we need, Dave is close to having more research done or, or, um, or compiling his research. Just knowing that uh, we are effectively behind the eight ball a little bit. There are plenty of other towns that do have 
some sort of kayak policy. And by next meeting, we'll have at least some description out to everybody of what other towns have been doing. Uh, I don't know if we'll have a proposal of what to do, but just to share what other towns have been doing to uh, give us ideas for uh, for next spring. Okay. So we'll, we'll leave it on the uh, agenda for next meeting to get an update on that. Is that what you're, is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, very good. The next item on the agenda is uh, Conservation Park stone block removal findings. I think someone from the board, someone from the group said that they were going to talk to conservation about these. Blocks. I spoke. Oops, I spoke ahead. to conservation. You did. Okay. Uh, DPW DPW moved the block, and it's uh, conservation is going to have them put back. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that should, you know, that should take care of that. Okay. Got it. Any reason why why DPW moved them? Uh, I think it was so that they could mow the grass in there. I'm, I'm not 100% <laughs> sure. Or one of them was a voter. <laughs> Maybe just because they could. Yeah. I think yeah. you got that right. <laughs> you know. There was a voter involved. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I did have a chance to speak with uh, Brad White here, Marshfield Hills, did have a chance to speak with Amy Walkie in conservation uh, about this about a month ago. And she indicated that the parking, after all the comments I made about how it was replanted by then conservation agent Vin Kaleshis to be a conservation area to hold up and support the uh, the, the reeds and, the, and, and everything that lives in a conservation area like that. Uh, she indicated that it might be part of a bigger master plan, that they liked the idea, they saw that it worked, it didn't seem to be harming anything. So there seems to be two sides of the story on that, I just thought I'd share that. Hmm. Interesting. All right, thank you, Brett, for chiming yeah. in on that. Yeah. Anyone else on uh, th that there? I think we kind of see there's a resolution kind of coming in place to move the block back, and I think that was the only thing that was outstanding on that, so. Well, you know, there, there's that, Brad, that's kind of a contradiction. You're saying that the conservation wants the blocks kept, that area kept open for parking? That's what set up the flares for me, uh, Craig, because as you remember, during the Save Our Ramp campaign, when that was uh, closed at midnight, uh, that was supposed to remain a growing, nurturing virgin area. That was the marching order we all had. And when the rocks moved back in August, I guess, and they could fit, they being the users of the area, you know, 15 to 18 F-150 trucks with trailers, nobody really said anything until I looked at it and said, wow, this was against what we all agreed to 10 years ago. So that I am, agree I am in agreement with you. There was, uh, it seems to be a conflict, but, you know, conservation is conservation. So they're aware of it and they're thinking we, they need to do something to accommodate the increase in use of that uh, ramp. Yeah, you know, and I, I, I tend to agree with that. I, I really don't think that area is uh, that sensitive that they can't park there. Um, you know, that, that, that them putting those blocks in that way back when uh, was kind of to keep um, people from, the, the whole original idea was to keep people from driving around and and parking up there, but um, you know, the people were parking there for 20 years before they put those blocks in. Mm -hmm. I was parking there for, for a long time before they put those blocks in. So I really don't have a problem with them opening that up for, for, park, for additional parking. As long as it doesn't cause the original mission of uh, closing that ramp. So for instance, I agree with you, but if by opening up that area for parking, uh, like it used to be, grandfathering it, as long as it doesn't shut down that, uh, you know, dirt ramp, great. We've also asked for you, you have, I have proper signage so that people aren't bringing in their dual tandem trailers with their 38 foot scarab. So yeah. that's what I said sure. to Amy, that hopefully you can come up with a better master plan. So anyway, that's, uh, right. that's what I learned. 
Yeah, I guess I mean, Rick, I, Rick, Rick you were involved way back when. What, do, what, what's your thought on opening that up for parking again? I agree with Brad from the waterways perspective. We want to ensure the accessibility and the safe and continued sustainability of that ramp. I'm not an expert in F-150, F-250, F-350 weights on marsh and so on. If there's a way that we can, that the parking can be increased, then fine, but that's CONCOM's jurisdiction, not ours. Right. Ours is the jurisdiction of maintaining the ramp. Yeah, you're, you're right, you're right. That's, that's, right. that's part of uh, conservation and right. we've made the decision to open it up. Yeah. The motivations of Mr. Kalashas were complicated. Yes, it was. <laughs> Not entirely well, conservation oriented, shall we say? Right, right. Okay. Well, well stated. Yeah. Mike, One more I thing, Mike, if I, if I could jump in. Dave Friedman, while we're talking about Conservation Park, and Brendan's on this call too, um, we encouraged last year of conservation to stripe the parking lot. They did that. I don't, not that I know the signage there intimately, but I didn't notice any new or better signage. I think maybe this winter we ought to encourage them to put better signage so that Brendan, and you could chime in too, you, you, you guys can do a better job of, of, you know, of, of policing that, the parking there. Sure, yeah, I mean, we would have nothing to do with the signage, but if there was signage put up there, that, that parking lot is patrolled frequently, and um, even even further out in the conservation park is patrolled more frequently now, especially with the addition of the ATVs that we purchased. So um, if there was clearer signage, however that is, outlining the rules there, it would certainly make our job easier when we went in there, and, you know, if it's after 9 o'clock, if it's closed, or I'm not exactly sure what it's supposed to be there because there isn't signage, so. Sure, if you guys can work with somebody to get some signage up there, I'm sure that we could um, we could do some more uh, patrols in that area. Great. Thank you. All right. Dave Dauphine here. Hey, Dave. Go ahead. Yeah, just wanna, I just want to add on to that. Um, if I remember back on that whole campaign, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brad, um, the big deal with Agent Calicious was that the area was being overused for um, what it was intended for or what it could sustain, and that the ramp, the larger boats and the larger trailers and the craft coming in there were powering up on their trailers, washing out the ramp into the uh, into the Herring River, causing um, a, a real shallow area trying to get to the marina. So there were a number of different things. It wasn't just parking. And I think you have to be careful when we look at something like this, that everything is, is connected. And ultimately what happened was nothing. They blocked off the parking. Um, no, no plan was ever put in place by conservation to upgrade the ramp or there was different, there was different things talked about, whether it be made out of tires that were a grid that was put down there. There was, prefab ramps that you could place in there. There were mats that you could take in or take out. There was all kinds of stuff being discussed, but nothing ever happened. And that was the big problem with those of us that used the ramp was you closed it to use it. And then you never, you never finished the job about fixing it. So um, and that's how I, that's how I remember it. So today let's fast forward to today. We increased the usage. We increased the access we still haven't improved the facility. So this is a, this is a, a push and pull type operation. And really what needs to be done is, co is conservation needs to sit down, in my opinion, and devise a plan to, to maintain, not only maintain it, but update it. So it, it takes, it takes the traffic that it's, that it's getting. And then of course, when you open up more, ac more access to it, um, you create, the, the dilemma of the harbor master patrolling more access from that side of the river. So there's all kinds of things that go on. But as I remember, that, that was the whole deal with, with Agent Calicious was he blocked it right off and said you can't use it at all. And that was the negotiation that came in. Well, if we, if we can control the access to it, um, 
After my memory Kalishis, isn't after perfect. After was out of the picture for one reason or another, uh, we did have a meeting with Frank Snow, chairman of the CONCOM, and tried to come to some sort of understanding about these linkages because Mr. Dauphiny is correct and that there's, um, you know, and so is Craig and Brad. We, we want to have the ramp be useful. We want to have people be able to use the water. Sometimes if you, so you want to increase the parking if you can, but if they increase the parking so they're getting double axle trailers in there and big old boats that are too big, then those, those motivations are counter to each other. So I, I think Agreed. maybe it's their jurisdiction, but it's our jurisdiction. So maybe we should bring Frank Brack, bring Frank back and have a conversation at some point about this. Well, well and, and I think Con -Con I, is now. Right. I think, I think also back to, they weren't too bashful about coming in and ripping waterways apart in regards to Young's boat yard, if you will, and the paths and the maintenance and all those things. So it's a, so no, it's, it's obviously people have to work together on it. And that's the most important thing is that this is a shared access. Everybody wants to control it, but nobody wants to have responsibility. And I think um, that's, that's where we're at. Yeah, their view also was we're, we wanted, they felt we were telling them how to park and we felt they were telling us how to drive boats. So that wasn't a really great relationship. <laughs> I can see that happening. Yeah. Um, now we went down this road probably three, four years ago with these guys trying to get some improvements done, and we just, yeah, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but the, I get, think the general feeling was they weren't interested in doing anything there, right? Yeah. Yeah. It took three months for Dave uh, Sinkowski and I to get on their agenda just to mention that. You know, as a waterways committee, we were concerned with what was going on over there. They listened to us, and it took, I think, about a year and a half, and then they finally uh, striked. So they did something, but they're slow moving, and obviously their agenda is very full, and they're very busy, and it, it works okay, and um, it's not the highest priority of them right now. Damn right, yeah, yeah. Right. So do we have an actionable item out of uh, out of this, or are we just gonna, you know, they're gonna move the block back and let it be, or do, do, does someone wanna go back to them and say, no, we're gonna go back to the days? I think just let it be. Let it be. Yeah. All right. He's been under cover down like those Mike, there was one thing. Do you remember we had the meeting at the uh, Situate New Safety Center and the Coast Guard was there and I brought this up and they said, oh, they'd be happy to do the signage. Uh, that was the fellow that was in uh, Hull. I think he was one of the commanders there. And he said, yeah, sure, we can provide money or signage or whatever you need. So, you know, if we reconnect with that source, uh, it would make sense for the Coast Guard to do the signage for the safety part down there by the bushes. And then the town would do the signage uh, as necessary in the parking area. And we also had talked about restriping that parking area. So those, I think, are action points from, from Waterways perspective, even though it's access to the water and it's talking about parking lot sign, uh, uh, painting. But those signs are mission critical for safety, in my opinion, because they're 20 years old. Yeah. All right. We're gonna, we'll leave this on and we'll try to get some people together that can kind of work on that. How's that? Brad. Uh, perfect. Yeah, you bet. If I can help, let me know. I've been trying to help for years on it. We just need to get the town's ear to have some action. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, next item on the agenda, I just had a letter sent to the Board of Selectmen on Waterways bylaw proposed changes. So last month we had voted to send um, a letter to the selectmen for proposed bylaw language change. And that was done. I'm just giving you an update that it was done, sent off to them. They will look to include us in a meeting, I believe November 17th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it was one of their next selectmen meetings. Uh, I don't believe Maura's on tonight, is she? She's not here, no. She's not, okay, yeah. Um, 
So it'll come up in the next one. Uh, I will make sure that I attend that um, meeting and uh, answer any questions they have on the changes. If anyone else wants to as well, I encourage you to uh, watch their agenda. I think it's coming out for the 17th. So. Um, under new business, unless anyone has any other comments, we're going to move to new business now. This is where we have a uh, financial update, Brian Kelly. Brian, you know, we talked about this. You said you might want to wait on this. Yeah, so um, as I sent, I sent documentation out to the members of the waterways Prior to this meeting uh, of information that was received in the past 24 hours, there were three documents that were important. The first one we already discussed, and that was uh, Steve's FY22 capital. Uh, the second thing is um, the audited year-over-year -year, uh, financials for the waterways that run from 2014 through 2020 actual. And then uh, the budget for FY21, which obviously is yet to be uh, approved, or rather finalized. Um, the net here is there's information that needs to be uh, provided uh, by the town specifically. Um, the FY22 final budget, that's something we can extrapolate. Uh, but the uh, money that we need to use out of FY22 for FY21. Um, and this is ancillary stuff that would not yet appear on capital request for FY21. So approved capital. So on that document, you'll actually see blank spaces for that. That was what was provided by Nancy. So that falls into a TBD. So overall, we look at it. You see retained earnings currently are in the range of $567,000, but they're skewed because really we need to pull away from that some of the already approved and or spent monies. Um, and that w should become um, available to us, um, if not November, uh, I'm sorry, if not uh, the next month meeting, the certain the one after. Um, the key on if people, without taking too much of a deep dive on this, the one key is that when you look at it, you'll see the revenues look really great and the expenses are tracking not too badly upwards. However, we have to um, normalize the $145,000 one-time FEMA reimbursement, uh, which occurred in FY20. And that was for the pedestals and electrical. Um, mm -hmm. Conversely, the uh, on the expenses side, it straddled over two years. So it really washes itself. Um, and the reality is that our numbers of 1.37 million in revenue, uh, an actual uh, 20 will certainly be reduced back into the 1.25 range, give or take, maybe a little uptick. Um, but I encourage the members of the waterways to take a look at this and we can have a uh, more meaningful conversation because there are certain areas that uh, that I'm still in the process of expanding the information specifically on the purchase of services. We saw the spike there. I believe that was indeed uh, the pedestal and electrical required areas. Indirect costs, you'll also notice is spiking and that's something that will be uh, with us uh, for obviously, as long as we run the waterways, because we had a very large spike in insurance costs. Um, and primarily for three reasons. One, there was an overall increase uh, on uh, general, um, rather insurance for the buildings and for um, uh, personal insurance. Secondly, um, the state had a uh, uh, insurance fund that all the towns uh, which had marinas were able to buy into. They ended that this year. So we were forced into the private market, uh, which is causing a, uh, an increase there. And finally, while not a lot of money, uh, we did not have any ice damage uh, insurance. And obviously, since we're going to be leaving the marinas and the and the pilings in year round, not the marinas, I'm sorry, we'll be leaving the pilings 
uh, some of the dockaging um, that we needed to in, uh, to add that onto our insurance. So overall, our insurance rates took a pretty healthy spike of uh, approximately $25,000. Uh, and that's what you're gonna see in the indirect cost. But overall, I tried to keep it short and brief. Overall, the fund is pretty robust. Um, we need to figure out long-term, that being out two to three years, if we will or will not receive a grant for the docs and what we're what our appetite is to do in terms of replace repair if possible, because if we have to fund this ourselves, um, we'd be looking at a rather large um, debt um, expense, probably somewhere in the vicinity of a quarter of a million dollars annually, which dovetails right over to the last document I sent out to everybody, which is the long term debt. Um, and I'd share my screen on this, but. I, I can share it if you want. Uh, sure, that'd be great. Yeah, give me one second here, let me just open it. And there it is, no. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be pretty good. It, it it's like a t-shirt on Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let me see if I can move my guy around here. Does that help when I do that? Sure does. So, so what what well, everybody's looking at here is uh, the current debt, which includes both last year's dredging and obviously an addition. I'm sorry, not obviously, but the the new Harbor Mass of Fire boat. Um, if you take a look at it you can see that we're gonna have a, a spike, not a spike, but an increase short term, 22 and 23 on our debt. However, after that, it starts dropping significantly over the next couple of years. So the, the great news is the Marine Park, um, the facility, the land, et cetera, are all gonna start falling off uh, the debt side in FY25 or FY26, we go all the way down to a current commitment base of $85,000 approximately from uh, our current year of, or actually next year of 433. So overall, this is great, uh, but that doesn't mean we should go out and spend $300,000 a year in new debt on a marina on the docks. Uh, I'm sure we'll be having over the next 10 years, other expenses that we need to plan for. But that's a, that's a conversation for another day. So the, the net of this is what I'm going to do is take two scenarios. That is, we're able to get a Seaport grant and we're not and run it out uh, over um, several years and extrapolate the revenue or forecast the revenue out uh, and expenses out uh, probably to 2030 uh, and figure out uh, the impacts, which will then lead to conversations about whether or not there's uh, an ability to either uh, cut expenses somehow or obviously look at uh, some type of uh, mooring slip fee increase, et cetera. So that's what I got in a nutshell right now. As I said, I received most of this information in the past 24 hours. So um, while I've had an opportunity to um, review it, I know you guys really haven't because you've only had it for a couple of hours. Um, if you'd like to review it and get back to me, I'm available to either meet or have a, com a phone call conversation on it. And then next month, we can certainly take uh, a deeper dive in it. Okay. Yeah, I'd say thank you very much. I mean, that information, if you're going to pull together and extrapolate that out, that's great, Brian. If you can kind of do that and kind of uh, give us a look. Hey, here's where the the Marine Park debt is dropping off here, right? Here's where we're going to incur some likely some additional borrowing um, or spending due to marina replacement, whatever. What does that look like over time? And it'll give us a much better picture of the long-term health and financial stability of the fund. And one last thing, Mike, I also reached out to Nancy and have extended an invitation for her to attend um, uh, one of our next 
uh, waterways meeting. So I know this is a busy time for her. Obviously, uh, she finishes capital plan and rolls right into budgets. Um, so uh, I'm not sure what her availability is, but uh, Nancy's uh, um, one of the hardest working people in the town. And if she can figure out a way to squeeze it in, she will. I know. Yeah, that'd be great. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Brian on that? Um, not for Brian, but I, I got to, since we're talking financials, a question for Stephen. Um, any guidance that the TA gave you in putting your budget together on the expense side? Uh, um, I know it's not approved or anything, but can you share anything with us about it? Level funding. Same and, as last year. No increase. Okay. And then, because uh, you, you were talking about paying your guys more and all that and needing more money for already, that. I that's that happened what, that's a little already, bit this year. That's already been done. Okay, so an, enough of a level where you feel they're content. Yep. Okay, great. Right Thanks. Now. Okay. Good. Anyone else? All right. Thanks again. Um, moving along here, um, we the last meeting we had some people that chimed in said that there was more discussion regarding enforcement patrols within the North and South Rivers, and we had some people sharing kind of their experiences. I want to say Dave did, Rick, and a few other people. Uh, um, so we wanted to have discussion around that. I did invite tonight uh, Brendan to join in just so that he's part of the discussion and kind of understands kind of what's being talked about. And then uh, obviously Stephen, I did invite Mr. DeMeo. I don't think I've seen him join in, um, although he was going to join in as well. Maybe he got sidetracked. So. Um, so if you recall from the last meeting, there was uh, just – ongoing we've seen this kind of throughout pretty much all summer long discussion about uh you know uh, patrols coordinated patrols um you know some people saying lack of patrols in the rivers so we just figured we'd have a group kind of discussion here about that and then try to put our heads together and and, and get everyone connected so um anyone want to kind of kick it off kind of with to share their kind of uh views of kind of how it was last summer down there and where they saw bright spots or maybe not so bright spots and, and what, what you think might need to be done. Uh, pretty... Dave Dauphine here. I would love to. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Uh, front row seat, as everyone knows. Um, um, I can only, as, as a kind of a review, I can only say that that myself and other neighbors and other uh, people that are that are on the river quite a bit sorry uh, marked improvement um, as a as a result of the enforcement and the presence and the shared presence in the river so um, my hats off to to officer Macaulay and his staff and 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 mostly Steve and, and his staff for um, not only the taking the time to um, listen to concerns, not only from me, but others, but um, doing uh, a yeoman's job as far as enacting some sort of a plan to get down there and, and try to uh, control the lawless activity that isn't new. It, it's for whatever reason, maybe it was this virus, maybe there was just more people. I, I don't know what it was. Maybe it's my demeanor or, or lack thereof, um, but, um, it, it came to a, a, a screaming head and um, Stephen made a plan and he reacted to that quickly and, uh, and just kind of pulled his resources together and made it happen. So I just want to, I want to say thank you to him and his staff um, for coming down there. And uh, we now have nicknames for those that love to come down there and those that don't, <laughs> but um, um uh, and I see, I see this. This isn't a one-time deal, and, and this is what I would like to offer as, as a, maybe an opinion, if 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 will. Um, this is a this is a process. It's been, in my in in, in my opinion, been not not over not I wouldn't say overlooked, but it hasn't been a priority. I guess it would be. It, it falls. It, 
the rivers have always been, if you will, the stepchild of our town. And it, it was never a big deal until it became a big deal. Um, so anyways, the reaction to that, um, I've, I've been in constant contact with Officer DeMayo about coverage from his side. Um, he has access to the cameras. Everybody seems to have a big role in this thing, but the, trying to get everybody to talk together about it is probably the biggest thing. But um, um, even even a couple weeks ago, uh, we had a great weekend, beautiful weekend. Um, the marinas aren't closed in the river. The people still have their floats in the river. There's still plenty of activity in the river, and it was a complete shit show. And um, I spoke to Stephen about this and uh, brought it to his attention, and um, he made some changes, and the following weekend they were down there to cover, and they had 14 or 20 stops on a Sunday, uh, a Saturday. And that's that's after everybody's closed and gone home. So um, this this river and our harbor are, are year round operations, and the and the boating seems to be going longer and longer with the marinas and the river that stay open longer and longer. So um, I I look forward to I, I'm excited for next year. I, I'm hoping that it's ratcheted up as far as tracking the warnings and the repeat offenders. Um, just just uh, last week. Um, I had the rails ripped off my skiff. I was I was standing in my skiff at Damon's Point when a guy went by. I couldn't get the number off the boat, but I got it the next day when he was parked with TKs. So, um, you know, you gotta the dog needs to hunt, and I'm okay with that. So, um, but anyways, I just that's just kind of a follow up. I, I I encourage the activity. I encourage the recreation it's the greatest place for me in the world but it also needs to be um we can put all the buoys signs and everything we want about no wakes and people are clueless to it or uh, claim ignorance as a defense so um I'm, i look to next year as being maybe a little bit tougher as far as issuing fines um tickets warnings written warnings those types of things and it's a and it's a learning curve so I, i'll i'll leave it at that all right, thanks, Dave. Um, David, I want to I want to thank you very much and uh, for your compliment, and I will extend it to my whole staff. Also, yep. I will, you know, reach out. You know, um, I want to thank Brendan and um, uh, Situate Marine Unit, and also Mike DeMeo. The, yep. You know, all 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 three departments did you know an outstanding job. I think. You know, once we were made aware of it. You know, I yeah, and it didn't start off. There, we you know, just... it didn't start off as as an issue in the in the springtime, but it it rapidly became something. And I know Brian, my my river my river cousin on the South River. Um, I know that he saw stuff going on, and he has brought it to attention. So it's a you know, and then you get to the Herring River. That's there you go. There you start that whole zoo. So anyway, yeah. it, I mean, we we try to keep the boat moving. So if we're seen. It's just like if you if you drive on you know Route Three every day and you see the speed trap in the same spot, you just slow down before the speed trap, and and then as soon as you get by, you accelerate back out. You know, well, some people boats do. Are, I would never if, do that. I, if, if the boats are always moving, you know, it, it tends to slow them down. I mean, I spoke to you where we had a guy call up and complain. He wanted to know, you know, he said. You know, I just want to call. I got, I got an issue. I, I want to know why I was stopped. I know I was speeding in the river, but I want to know why I was stopped <laughs> for speeding. I mean, this is, yeah, you know, they, this is what we're dealing dog, with. The guy with the guy with the dog blocking his view, and the, that was the reason why he needed to do 25 miles an hour down the river so he could see past the dog was probably. That's the guy I stopped. <laughs> Two, two, yeah, that's the top two things I ever heard about in the river, and I, and I almost you almost want to give him a free pass for being that creative. Never mind, I won't I won't go down. Yeah, creative. That's a good creative. word. That's a good word. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I think uh, also if I can if I can add the moving around the you can you can hang on the buoy at the mouth of the river and everybody knows you're there. It doesn't matter. But I think Brendan and you can chime in on this when when a harbor master is upriver and and MP one is is downriver um you know you it, it's it's 
it's it's bizarre. I have a catalog of pitches that I will try to get into an email and I send it out to you guys just to show what I this is just me what I see and, and how how it negatively affects what goes on down there and and um and there's a whole plan on the river to put cameras and game cameras and and different things in there so that we can you know it's like a police neighborhood type of thing. I don't know. It's crazy. Well, I think the three agencies worked well together this year, and I think they, the three agencies did, you know, once we were all made aware of it, did a great job in the river. Yeah. I've seen state police in there. I've seen NOAA. I've seen Coast Guard. I've seen you guys. I've seen Marshfield. And we're I've not going to talk about one. those guys. We're just talking about us. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I wish uh, I, I wish wouldn't say they were there consistently, but the three that you mentioned are yes. I wish Dave Sinkowski was on on tonight because I know he specifically asked to have this kind of added in. He wanted to be part of the discussion, so maybe he can circle back with him and talk about it. Anyone else? But I think maybe. Ever? What's that? Can we keep that on the? Can we keep it on our our waterways agenda so that we can continue on with with somehow working forward so that the marinas that particularly cater to river customers get a notice or get an idea from from what's going on that please be advised that we are stepping up our patrols and our enforcement and and, and we're coming to a zero tolerance area and they need to know about it and, and you gotta kind of over educate them so they can't say they didn't know but um, I don't know that's just some thoughts yeah, good, good stuff. Anyone else from, from the either the board or the audience that wants to chime in with regards to the enforcement of the rivers before I kind of um, I'll give you a just kind of a heads up, Brent. I'll just ask you to speak to it for a minute, and um, if no one else has a comment, and then we can kind of move along. Yeah, this is uh, Brian Cronin, um, Dave's cousin from the South River. Um, I <laughs> I would say uh, we want to uh, carry the, the, the momentum into the spring and, and, and like Dave said, you know, really um, have a presence down there and, and prevent it from getting bad and, uh, and just really make sure people, uh, the boaters understand that it's, you know, it is a no way carrier and, it, and to follow the rules. So um, just, I'd say start strong and, and carry it all the way through the season uh, next year. Right, great. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. I would just say my own personal experiences this year was that just that it was, um, you know, busier than I've ever seen it down there. So I typically would kind of avoid it unless I was, you know, um, unless it was after hours or whatever. But, uh, you know, it still needs additional level or kind of enforcement right along the spit area that most of the stuff is happening. So um, I did talk to Mr. DeMayo, Harbor Master DeMayo, the other week. He, he had uh, let me know about something that I was unaware of, that you guys have some sort of tool to kind of help coordinate the patrols down there, which I thought was a, a great idea. I didn't realize that was in place. And I know that was one of the things that Mr. Sikorsky, Dave, was asking about uh, specifically is how that stuff's being um, coordinated. So that, that was, you know, something if you want to comment on that, Brendan, that would be great. Yeah, so I mean, I'm going to echo what everybody else has said. This is probably one of the busiest seasons, not only on the water, but also on the land side for us at the police department with, with COVID and everything else that's going on this year. I've seen a marked increase in, in uh, call volume and also a, a marked increase in the, um, the type of calls that we've had. Uh, we had a lot more significant um, and uh, like a higher level uh, call on the water this year too, from every, from suicidal people to kidnappings. To poaching, we had it all this year. Um, so I, for the river itself this year, we tried to do the coordinated response. We, we endeavor not to have what we like to call a law enforcement parade in there, where we have all of our assets in the same area at the same time. That does no good. It's like taking the entire patrol shift and putting them in a line going down 3A to stop cars. Like yeah, there's a whole bunch of area that needs to be covered. So with that being said, we are responsible not only for the river system, North, South and Herring, but also all of our coastline, including Bassins Beach, which saw a marked increase in boat traffic also, uh, significantly so from places like World's End being closed 
um, in other sections and other marinas that shut down or outlawed rafting, things of that nature, things that didn't really happen in our area. So they saw a lot of increase up there. Coasa police were able to get out there occasionally, but they needed some assistance. So we can't be everywhere at once. Um, so trying to do a coordinated response was, was more important than ever for this year. The system that Mike is, is talking about is, is an app on our phone. It's called Crew. Um, it was something one of our officers, Officer Mark Brennan, is, um, came up with a few years ago. Uh, we started using it with our organization called CHAMP, which is a training organization. I'm the director of training for. Mark's our vice president. Mike DeMeo is our president. Um, this information sharing app has brought together um, 29 different communities. I think right now we're about 217 users on there. Uh, Mark is, is the administrator. I'm the assistant administrator of this app. Um, and what it is, is basically like it's a text message app. Um, and we're able to break that down into different regions. Um, so we were able this year to um, just have a region for here in Situate. So it was, it was Cohasset, Situate, and Marshfield. So we had the Situate Harbor Master on there. A couple of their guys wanted to get, uh, wanted to join. Not everybody, but a few. Um, and a few of Mike DeMeo's guys also. So what that did, instead of making four phone calls, and uh, I've worked in the past with Mike DeMeo with doing spreadsheets with staffing for the weekends and all this, like it never seemed to work right. So this app with one push of a button, we can say MP1 underway, um, we'll say Brennan and McCauley um, on board. So that went out to the entire group, whether you're working or you're not group working, that, in, that group and also on that group is our chief is on that group. Um, the officer of the day in Coast Guard Sector Boston, they, they've embraced this app. So they actually got a smartphone. So the officer of the day is on that app. Um, the commanding officer from Point Allerton and the entire boat crew at Station Point Allerton, both sections are on this. So with one text message, you have like 40 something people that know what's going on. So during a critical incident, that's highly important, especially when you're trying to drive a boat, manage a radio, manage a cell phone, you can be pushing out real live information um, so we used it uh, several times this year um, in our region, and it, and it worked out outstandingly. With that, we tried to uh, coordinate our response specifically in the river. So uh, MP1's in the river, heading, heading up the North River. Um, we would have the few guys from the Harbor Master's Office that were on it. If they were working, hey, you know, we're heading to the South River. Um, hey, you know, we saw a blue boat heading up the North River, um, MP1, if you see it coming back down. Like things like that. Um, and that def definitely, it helped uh, coordinate the response so we could give the kind of the illusion that we were in more places. You know, we have a lot of water to cover. Um, and, you know, it is difficult when you only have a few boats to do that. Um, and then we add that with the, with the increased volume this year, and it was a real challenge. Um, so that definitely worked out better. Um, hopefully we can continue to use that app moving forward. We use it, I'm on a, a regional dive team. We use it as our primary communications group. We use it in Boston. The environmental police are on there. The state police are on there. Um, so hopefully we can get some more people in our region on that next year um, and, and, and coordinate even better, um, hopefully. In addition to that, and I know you guys are more specifically talking about the river, um, in the spit from the water side, but we also have like the land side of that too. So in addition to that, we, we did a much better job, I feel this year, of getting more directed patrols on the spit side of, of the, um, the spit side on, on the actual beach. We did that with foot patrols and then we were able to secure through some um, funding, a couple of ATVs and train some officers on that. Um, so getting out there, interacting with the, with the public, um, getting ahead of the groups of kids that are out there that are leaving trash, going into the bird areas, things of that nature, kind of cutting that off and using MP1 with the officers on board. Sometimes we put additional officers on board to help augment the, the, the patrols on the beach. So, it, you know, you say six, 700 boats maybe on a weekend in there, say an average of four people per boat, 2,400 people, two police officers on a boat, two police officers on an ATV. Yeah. <laughs> the odds are really that good. So um, having that kind of mirrored patrol, we, we did a lot of that this year. And, and we had instances, I personally jumped off the boat several times onto the beach to assist the land side officers that were there. Um, I know other guys did too. Um, and then moving out from that, you had like the deep hole in Marshfield, which exploded. I mean, you had 20 boats rafted up, it seemed like at some points in there. Um, and that was, that, that was definitely an issue. 
And then I think, you know, you guys have noticed it too, like going up the river towards the Herring River, what used to be all mud flats are now halfway decent beach. There may be a lot of razor clams mixed in there, but like there's still a lot of boats going in there. So our area I'm working is, on the uh, razor clams. <laughs> I'm working on are, getting rid of the razor clams. <laughs> is that gonna be your, I saw the sign on the house says lobsters. Now it's going to be lobsters and razor clams or something like that. And be, well, on the other side, it says clam a lot. Oh, clam a lot. There we go. Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, there's just a lot of people in there, you know, and, and, um, and you know, with the you know, COVID this year, I think you, you saw a lot of people that didn't travel. People spent their money on boats and paddle craft and everything else. Um, and I don't think that's going away, as you guys said. I mean, you have people that have summer houses or, or not even just summer other residents in other states that they can't use. And maybe they've sold those and they bought a boat. You know, they're vested in this. Like, I don't think you're going to see a downturn next year or in two years. I think you're going to see this, like, hustling right now with what we have going on out there. 911 calls were through the roof this year, uh, mostly accidental. Uh, because of the software updates, both on the road and on the boat, by policy, the department has to respond to every single 911 call. It's mm -hmm. policy. So it doesn't matter if it's um, at, you know, on Manlot Road or if it's out, you know, and it's paying two and a half miles east of mine at light. We're responsible for it. So that chewed up a lot of time for us. Um, we were able to use the Marshfield and Situate Harbor Masters to assist us with locating, especially if it happened on the beach locating where that call came from. Uh, but at the end of the day, it has to be one of us that, that goes and vets that. Um, I know in my career, um, I've shown up to, to uh, 911 misdials, as they called it, and shown up and found um, an elderly w woman on the floor, a domestic in progress. Like, you never know. So you can't we, – we have seen such an uptick in that, and so has the Coast Guard. Um, that we have to vet everyone, and it takes a lot of, a lot of time and pulls us away from doing our dedicated patrols um, mm. also, you know? Mm. So um, we had, uh, this year we had a call in the river. I believe the call initially came into the Harbor Master's office uh, about a gentleman who had a group of kids on his boat and he was holding them hostage. Um, he had made reference that he was going to shoot anybody that tried to leave the boat. He had firearms on the boat. Um, mm. The ca call was transferred to us. Um, Soon after we got underway and we started making our way out there with the team of Marshfield Police, Central Police, um, and Harbor Master Assets, it was learned that the guy just had a little bit to drink, was embellishing a little bit about firearms and things of that nature, and it was a group of kids that just wanted to go home that took a ride from a guy. It turned out to be nothing, but you didn't know that and going into it, and that was like, uh, you know, one of the, it was like kind of heightened calls that like that's not we we haven't seen stuff like that before and and i think you just you had these kids that had never gone to the spit before they had gone just gone out there because they're looking for places to go in social distance that they're not you know not they're not being over policed and that's where they're going unfortunately yeah. um you know and um you know i think probably two months ago i mean it was towards the end of the season um we had a gentleman uh, from mansfield um the gentleman decided he was on an electronic bracelet and he decided to cut that bracelet off. Um, the gentleman had five warrants. He was a fugitive from justice. Uh, he made his way to Situate and stole a boat out of the Cole Parkway Marina um, and took off. Uh, the call was initially placed wow. to the Harbor Master's office from a lieutenant in Mansfield and then transferred up to us. And um, we went down there. The gentleman um, had been in contact with his girlfriend or ex-girlfriend um, had a history of firearms offenses, had a history of barricading himself and needing to be removed from his home with, by a SWAT team. Um, and he was a, on board a boat. And the last communication that we had was that he was going to uh, find his girlfriend and kill her. Oh, so that's an extension of a land call, right? Like we have stuff like that that happens on the land and it's no different. Like it happens out in the water. And this year with the increased traffic out there, we saw stuff like that, mental health cases, things of that nature happening on the water. Um, but with the, with the partnerships that we, we have in the region, in that case, we were able to devise a plan, get on board. Uh, shortly thereafter, we were able to get uh, in touch with the environmental police. Um, they sent an officer down to get underway on their boat that was in the harbor. Unfortunately, he was by himself. But we cross-trained with those guys all the time. It was seamless. Put one of our officers on board. Away we go. They talk the talk. They know the boat. It worked out great. 
Um, we encountered this gentleman off of mine at light. He didn't want to stop. He actually looked at us, shook his head, put the hammer down on the throttle and was heading to Cohasset. I don't know what his intentions were. He was heading right down into the Harbor. Um, fortunately, we had just completed a week long training, uh, down in Marshfield, the Mike DeMeo's place and tactical operator training. Um, myself and officer Billings along with Sergeant Bowman were on our boat. Uh, Taylor, officer Billings and I had just completed this class and it was almost textbook. Like we just did this type of stuff for suits, um, for an entire week. So we were able to, uh, was able to get alongside and, and transfer officer Billings on board and, um, assist the operator in stopping his boat. Um, we didn't locate a firearm, not to be say that there wasn't one on board. Um, and that, that gentleman was brought back to the Harbor. Um, and then just last weekend, um, what did we have about seven foot seas out there on Sunday. Uh, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, um, a woman was, uh, we had a, she was suicidal. She had some mental issues going on and her cell phone, uh, pinged and she happened to be about a mile and a half off of ocean side drive. Um, we went out there, uh, again, using the crew app, joint coordination, um, able to get the state police in a bigger boat because the sea state was horrible, um, able to spin up Quincy police on standby, the environmental police uh, big boat out of Boston, the Thomas Paine on standby, depending on what we had. Turns out at the end of the day, it was a software glitch. She wasn't there. She was actually in Rockland. Uh, um, but you have to go out and you got to vet this. And I think the reason why I bring all these up, and I know we're talking about the river, but I just kind of want to give an overview of like the season in its entirety. And those are only a couple of instances, like the higher, the higher, um, the higher severity calls that we are getting. And I can tell you from, from working in this Marine unit now, I think for six years, we would, we've never got calls like that. We've never had the amount of volume on the water in our area that we've had this year. Um, and even going further back, I mean, I started in the Harbor Master's Office before I came to the police department. I can never remember it being this busy. Um, and we're seeing a lot of that, you know, you add all the stress, the pandemic and stuff, we're seeing a lot more mental health cases. And that's also taking place on the water, you know. Um, so I agree, we should be out there earlier next year and, and really showing that presence. And, you know, I have to see how it goes. You know, um, but I'm expecting it to be the same, if not worse, next year. So, so. Well, that's great. That was a great overview. Uh, I appreciate that. I think you guys have done a great job this year, kind of stepping it up, and I'm really happy to hear it. I know Mr. Sinkowski and some other people were really kind of always asking about how is how is everything being coordinated, and it sounds like you guys put together a great system between the different groups and it also includes the Coast Guard and everyone else so that um, it helps to provide the pres presence out there on the water so that people kind of pay attention to what's happening and don't screw yeah. yeah, and we, you know, we, we work closely with, the, with a lot of different agencies in the area and specifically Coast Guard Station Situate. I mean, we're so fortunate to have those, um, the, that group of men and women down there um, at our disposal. Like it, I, they just signed their lease again. So I know there was talk about them leaving, but I spoke to them and it's, they re up their lease. So they, they're not going anywhere, which is great. Yeah, that's good um, enough. Yeah. So we were able to work out, uh, an MOU with it, with their, their parent station is point Allerton. Um, we were able to, to work out, um, an agreement with them so we can get on their boat. They can get on our boat. Um, so we did a lot of joint patrols. So they may have, um, reservists in for the weekend that are taking the boat. So the actual, boat crew for that four-day rotation doesn't have a ride because the reservists are using the boat. So they would get on with them, with us, or one or two of them, um, and go out and do the joint patrols uh, and assist them. You know, they would they would do their boat stops, do their 4100 forms, give the people the, uh, you know, the safety certificates so they can keep them on their boat. Um, and then if there was anything, warrants, other issues that we at, at, a, at a local level would deal with, um, you know, that that blend worked out really, really well. You know, I mean, we did a lot of joint stuff with the uh, environmental police this year, too. Um, so I, I thought that worked out really well. And I'll say, like, uh, it, it, with, with Dave's comment um, about the marinas, I, w I will say, definitely, we <laughs> with the rental fleet going out as much as it did this year from Rope Marine, having a lot of interactions with those guys, we were able to work with the managers um, at Rote and kind of assisting them in their um, – 
what their like I don't know what I call it safety protocols, but like advising the people that are renting the boat what the safety precautions were on board the vessel and then the rules of the road. Um, and this started about five years ago. We went down there, um, and I believe there's a flyer or something they hand out now. Uh, but we had been working with them to like, hey, you know, like this is a dangerous inlet. We may we may not may not be still on the top ten on the eastern seaboard like we used to be, but it's still dangerous. So having some type of information for people to know, and furthermore, just like red right return, like just like these are the buoys that you're going to interact with. Maybe you should know what they mean. Um, you know, I think you. you I mean, we've all seen them, right? The the pontoon boat stranded up on the beach. Um, we we were sitting on the mooring. Uh, the, 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 that Mike DeMeo had put in there out by the, the, uh, the junction buoy. And I'm, I'm just having my dinner and I look over and I see a pontoon boat floating away with nobody on it. And I said, that's a rope rental boat. They had, they threw the anchor out. They had no idea they were supposed to tie the anchor to the boat. So, <laughs> so um, I've done we, that. I've done <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, so, um, but what, what I'll say, the staff up there is great. And, and um, they, they're on our, on our crew app, but I would say, like, the manager up there, I would talk to him almost every day. I talk to him on my off days. He'd call me, hey, we got a boat beach up there. We know about it. We'll take care of it. Um, he'd call and say, hey, like, you know, this boat that they rented hasn't come back yet. If you guys see it, and we would help escorting those people back. Um, they've been great to work with, and I know they're trying. Um, but what I think we've seen, and I'm sure you guys that are out there a lot have seen it, we got a lot of boats from other areas coming down. Yeah, a lot yeah. of out-of-town boats. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And ignorance is no excuse, but a lot of them just had no idea. We, I saw a huge uptick in PWCs in the river this year. You know, tons of people went out and bought jet skis. They have no idea they can't come into the river with them. Yeah. Um, they're launching them at Conservation Park sometimes. You know, um, which which comes back to signage and saying no PWCs, you know. Um, so it, it was, uh, you know, it, it's been it seems like it's just for people want to get out and, and do their social distance. Like uh, we have a great area to do that down here. And it draws in a lot of people, which is good if they're going into the harbor and they're going to local business and stuff like that. But from an LE side, it's it's kind of like I don't want to use the word nightmare, but it's tough. You know, it's really, it's made it tough for us because, you know, we have really busy days out there. And I think overall, we, as the police department, did a great job of staffing the boat seven days a week um, and getting, getting underway a lot more this year than we have last year, which was more than the year before. So each year we seem to get better and better and trying to like tweak that and figure out exactly how we work and, um, you know, without increasing staff, how do we make it work, you know? Yeah, um, so yeah. we did a much better job this year. Could always be better, but I mean, we, we, I think we overall, we, we did a much better job this year. Yeah, applaud you for that. That's great. Yeah, thank you, know, you. you guys had a busy year, Steven, your team, all of you guys had a busy year and, and really no fatalities or really bad injuries, which is always, uh, you know, great. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, great. Yeah. Anyone else from the uh, the board or from the audience that have any questions regarding the law enforcement <clears throat> comments, anything? Uh, uh, Brad White, uh, Brendan, that was an incredible report. You know, I've been doing this for 10 or 12 years and have never heard such a comprehensive report. And, and congratulations on all your success. And I will tell you, yesterday I was at uh, Monaghan Marine and also Scalise Marine. And I just asked both uh, uh, owners when I was there, tell me how business was for the year. And uh, they both said up over 50%. And then I take a look usually, and typically I stay in touch with the marine statistics through soundings trade and sales are up 35%. Boat registrations are up 35%. So, you know, you guys did a Herculean job of managing that increase. And it's interesting you say that the boats that are rented from Rope Marine are going through a safety program. You know, many times when I was visiting Florida or, or the West Coast to do scuba diving, you've got to see the video. You've got to see what it's all about. It's three minutes, and maybe right. you can gravitate to that so folks can, uh, you know, get a warm fuzzy before they get behind the wheel. So, anyway, great report. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, it, you know, I don't want to push too much on what I think to how they should be running their business. I don't know if that's something that Waterways can approach them or something. I, I've, been, I've rented, I've dove I've, all over the place. We dove in Belize. I wish it was a three-minute video. It was like a half an hour we had to watch before we could go diving. Um, 
it, it might not be a bad idea, you know, in, in a lot of those boats, they stay within the river system. So it's not like we need to teach them inland water markers, channel markers and things of that nature. Like it's very simple. We could maybe just take in some pictures of the areas that they'd encounter and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if it's our place to, to push that, um, but I might, would maybe, certainly, maybe know, suggest it. Yeah. yeah. Maybe suggest well, yeah. it, but I have a question for you. Sure. And it's, it's, it's classified. Okay. How do you sit in your driver's seat you. at night and have light outside? Wait a minute. Say it one more time. I'm sorry. I'm looking at your video right now. When you're sitting in a vehicle and yep. the left-hand side is uh, daylight. That's I'm inside the giant outbuilding here at the police station. I don't know if you can see ah, that. Ah, okay. okay. Inflatable boat sitting right next to me. I got a car okay. over here. Um, I was. That's why my video wasn't on when I first started. I had my son... I had a lot of stuff going on. My That's all right. I was just getting back into town, so I was trying to shovel down my dinner. So Mike sent me a thing to say, turn on your video. I go, well, no one wants to eat, watch me eat this pasta. So, <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's why it's so bright out there. And I've been driving with no hands for a while. So yeah, I thought you were in the harbor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> all right. Thank you, uh, Brendan, for coming on tonight and, uh, and for Thank all you guys to do this year together to kind of coordinate everything. We appreciate that. Thank you. Really? All right, guys, we're down to the last item here. We're, we're about two hours into this here, so let's see if we can plow through here and finish up. Um, Brad, you had asked me to add you on to the agenda to talk regarding mooring ball stickers, so I would, I would ask you to kind of report in your Sure, findings. you bet. I think there was an agenda item there about the clam flats as well up on top of me. Do you want to do that? Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped right over that. You know what? I sent out something to the people on the board regarding um, – closures in the river from the DMF regarding uh, uh, being closed. Typically they open back up, what, November 1st um, for clamming in the river, but um, it has been closed until there's more studies done. And I'll ask someone on here, maybe Dave, I think I shared some information with you if you know a little bit more about that. Dave Doffney, that is, Dr. Doffney. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um so um, disappointed um, to say the least to get to get word of this notice um, two days before the opening. Um, this has to do. Uh, I've done I've done a, a fair amount of uh, uh, homework, back work on this, talking to different people. Um, basically, and I give you just a quickie on it is that the Division of Marine Fisheries is trying to be compliant with. New, new rules from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration as it pertains to uh, the critical, critical aspects of the DMF shellfish growing area classification program. So what this means is three years ago, they came up with this test. Um, they do um, bacterial tests weekly or monthly through uh, DMF that we test the water quality. It's one of the things that I partook in to get the 300 acres opened in the South River for recreational shell fishing. So um, now they want to do a viral test. And in order to do a viral test, they need to do um, some sort of dye um, release from the sewer plant in not only Green Harbor, but Situate. Until that point, they've closed the flats down to any shell fishing. Although at this point, what I found out is the FDA rules pertain to the interstate transport of sale of commercial harvested shellfish, which our area does not support. So I poked the hornet's nest a little bit here to try to find out exactly what's going on. Um, um, they have closed it um, for a year as of today, and they cannot close it next year. They would have to put it into prohibited which would take anywhere from five to seven years, as I understand, to reopen again to be classified as um, uh, in a different classification. So to, uh, to myself and a number of people that have worked hard to get this area to be as productive as it has over the, over the last years, I, I myself has been probably 47 years of clamming. One of my first remembrances on the water with my dad doing this activity um, this is where we're at. So trying to get a little more information on it. Um, again, um, 
It says here that temporarily the FDA has agreed to allow DMF to keep the areas MB5 and MB6 in closed status rather than downgrade the classification to prohibited. Um, yeah, Dave, Dave, it's really, it's extremely disappointed to hear this happen. You know, it, it just really, you know, that, that the last year was probably the most productive clamming I've done in on the river in a long, long time. Uh, for me, it's the, it, as I told you and I've told others, and I brought, I brought dozens of people out this year. Friends, got them, get, get a license, come out, please. And um, honestly, for somebody like myself, it was an outdoor, um, it was a, uh, it was social distance, it was an activity, it was a uh, celebration when you got home to eat these things. And, and the, but even if you didn't, you gave them to people who loved them and they were just, so what, what I, what, what my, my anxiety, if there is any in this, is the fact that if it's remained closed and it goes into prohibited, those flats, as we know now, will go foul. We will have mutters. We will have clam flats that will die out and the activity will stop. And the greatest part of what's going on down there for me anyways, over the last 20 years is the consistent activity. I would say there's 20 people um, that are very active and very consistent about clamming down there through the winter months. And that keeps that, those areas uh, moved around and they keep them aerated and it allows that spat to make a set. So that's what's happened over the years. So, so we're trying to devise a little bit of a, a game plan here and po quite possibly the town could dispute the findings or the closure by the DMF, uh, which I was told looks down frowns upon anybody who challenges their authority. Um, but in this case, black and white, from what I can find out, the regulation is for sale of commercially harvested shellfish and our area is recreation only. So I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, I, don't I, ha I don't have the answer, but that's where I'm at on it, so. Have you been, have you been talking to like the town administrator about it or? Uh, no, I, I talked to Tom Shields, who's our representative down here. I've worked with him over the last 15 years with DeMeo and Harbor Master Patterson on shellfish um, uh, relocation and um, propagation. Um, there is um, monies that's raised by those who want to put docks in. What do they call that when they, that's not a shakedown. It's more politically correct than that. But um <laughs> You know, they, they donate $1,000 to the shellfish propagation fund and the seed is bought and we go out and plant it um, in other places. So um, I went to Duxbury, $140 for your recreational license as an out-of-towner. Um, if you're a, you're a disabled vet, it's free. I'm not sure how all that works, but um, that's, this, those are, that's the closest option we have. The hey, Dave. Option. Yes, D Dave and Mike. Uh, uh, Brad and Dave spoke today. Brad and uh, Mike DeMeo spoke yesterday. And this is truly a ready, fire, aim approach. The river is really clean. Mike DeMeo tests it weekly. And I asked that question yesterday. He says the cleanest it's ever been. So this is not a uh, bacterial coliform situation. It is a, uh, uh, Dave, what do they call it? It's a viral um a viral test. Um, so, so what they did is for, they... for active viruses, and it had nothing to do with what's going on now. But it's it's uh, it's 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 so it's so um, I, I can't just get my arms around it. The water coming into the plant in, into our faucets at our homes is is it, the, the water coming out of the plant is cleaner than the water coming into our homes. So. That's true. I mean, that's so, so the basis of this, so everybody knows, is that the uh, potential future failure of the Marshfield uh, sewer plant, number one. Number two is, according to Mike DeMeo, in August, they sent a letter. They were supposed to do this uh, dye testing, which they didn't do. So they closed the flats, even without the scientific results from the dye testing. So I think the takeaway action points on this is that there's probably 200 licenses, maybe more that are sold between Situate and Marshfield. So there are people that are the uh, constituents here. Uh, the action points would be, and Dave Daphne described this to me today, this really needs to be presented to, I think the 
clam committee. I'm using the wrong word, but there's a woman that heads that up. Advise, yeah. Shellfish advisory board. Yeah. Shelf, shelf advisory that hopefully they can come back with waterways. And I would suggest that waterways uh, recommends to the selectmen to write a letter of dispute to the uh, people that have closed it. And I don't have the names in front of me, but the, uh, the guy that, that headed up. So Mike DeMeo is very conversant. Uh, uh, Dave Daphne is, uh, I learned a lot about it in the last couple of days because we love to clam and it's a great pastime. We feed our families and uh, it, it's a big, big bad takeaway. So that's my comment. Yeah. Yeah, the goal tonight was really just to make sure everyone knew about it and discuss it and see uh, kind of what we could kind of find out and move forward with. Yeah. You know. I will reach out to Shellfish Advisory and just discuss it with them as well. Great. All right. And anything I can help you with, Mike, on that, let me know. Um, All right. Thanks, Dave. Dave, Dave, Dave uh, Freeman, uh, are they scheduling a new uh, Shellfish Advisory meeting? Yeah, me as well. Dave? I think he fell asleep. I guess he fell asleep. Dave Freeman. Yeah, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is the shellfish um, scheduling a new meeting soon? We're trying to. We've been going back and forth on, uh, on dates, but it should be one day next week. Um, I don't know what I can share with this group, but. Uh, it um you know we're aware of the of the uh the legal actions that have been taken are you talking about uh Dassing's beach or yes the, or the closure in the north river no the we we haven't talked about the closure at all okay yeah it would be nice if there was any way to get that overturned yeah it would be right mm -hmm. What, the North and South River, Craig? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it for the whole year. Yeah, absolutely. For, for some dye tests? That haven't been done yet. So, Mike, I'll tell you what. We're planning a plan here. Get it to the Shellfish Commission and whoever does that. And uh, uh, yeah, Mike I'll, I'll said, that on and get, and get in touch with them and see uh, kind of where they're at, what they're doing about it, and see uh, kind of what next steps are and see if we can help them out. All right. All right. Um, Brad, the next item on the agenda is really kind of the mooring ball sticker. Uh, it was something that you asked to be to discuss. I don't know the history of this so much, so if you could just step back, not a not a deep dive, sure. kind of uh, in the interest of time, just give us kind of a little background on it and then where you're at. Sure. The pro the problem statement is people that use other people's moorings, whether they're transients or people that hop from one smaller mooring to a larger mooring during a storm have no uh, visual indicator as if the uh, mooring ball or, or, or stone or chain has been inspected or is in within oh. inspection. So my proposal two or three years ago was that when everybody scrambles to grab a mooring, you don't want to grab one that's maybe three or four years old, maybe out of inspection because you could have a failure and you could scrape everybody's boat in the harbor. So my recommendation and suggestion was to put a simple inspection sticker, much like the one you have on your license plate and your, on your vehicle, that's about the size of a pack of cigarettes or a deck of cards, that sticks on the ball. And let's say that the year 2020 has the color blue sticker and it says 20 on. And then 2021 is a green sticker and it says 21. And uh, uh, 2022, and then the reason why there's three years is because that's a three year inspection cycle. So, uh, by, by having a valid mooring inspection sticker on your ball, in addition to your name and your number, uh, the person using it, whether it's yourself or somebody else, can feel confident that the mooring is inspected and in good repair. So I went up to RFQ to find the uh, technical quality and the price. I spoke with both Marshfield Office Supply and also Ernie Foster over at Webster Printing. So Marshfield Office Supply came back with 20 cents a sticker cheap on a roll. And the recommendation was the same sticker they put on shipping containers that are the individualized uh, DR code or serial number that has to withstand the rigors of the ocean environment if that container goes overboard so that it could be identified at a later date. So they would use the same material 
they recommend color black with white letters because it will not get sun drenched. So the green, the red, the orange, forget about the colors, just use black with white. So the Marshfield office supply can do three rolls, 20 cents each, uh, like it's like $600, or Marshfield, uh, uh, Webster Printing would cut them out so you could buy fewer rather than the big rolls. And he hasn't come back yet with a price. So the homework I did was to put together a visual identifier every morning ball, of which they're like 900 in the harbor, I think. Uh, it's short money, and I think it should become part of the mooring inspection process. And maybe the mooring guys just buy the stickers, or they, you know, they, they buy one big roll every year, share it. And it's a good way to prevent during storms and non-storm events damage to people's personal property and boats, period. Okay. Um, all right. So that's interesting. So I, I do recall kind of what you were talking about there before. But it, is it when we have a storm or an event like that that people go out and just grab onto moorings that are not theirs? Yes. Happens all the time. Hmm. Yep. Maybe, maybe that's uh, part of the problem. Brad, Brad, I understand what you're trying to accomplish. I think. Um, the problem is, let, let's say there's a storm event coming and somebody pulls, goes out and they, you know, your mooring has a black sticker on it and they put, they just like, well, I'm just going to grab this mooring and put my boat on it. And then you show up three hours later to put your boat on it, but there's already a boat on it. You, it, you're, it, it's kind of creating a free-for-all out there. It is uh, a free-for-all, Steve. Should, well, it's not a free-for-all. That's your mooring. Do you, so, so it's okay if somebody just grabs your mooring? No. And, and, cut, and put their boat on that, it during the storm? No. Well, you know, what I'm suggesting is exactly what the Registry of Motor Vehicles does. If, if, you're, if your car is lawfully registered, I, I you get a sticker. That's all. I, I, I understand that. I get that. But what you're saying is the reason for this is so that people can just go out during a storm and know that if it has a sticker that says 2020 or 21 or 22 on it, that it's been inspected and, it, you know, it's past inspection and they just grab a hold of it and, and can tie up to it and then their boat's out on that mooring and they feel confident that be, that it, it's past inspection and it's not their mooring it's somebody else's mooring right uh, or it could be their mooring but somebody you know anybody can just grab any mooring that's out there jump on it so if during a storm you're in Boston or Rhode Island, wherever, and the storm's coming in, and I'm over at Cole Parkway, and I'm like, well, I'm going to put my boat on a mooring. Here's one over here. And I grab it, and it happens to be yours. You show up two hours later, put your boat out there, still in time, but the guy got there before you did. What that's do you do That's not what we're trying to protect from. That, Steve, that's, that's not what we're trying to protect from. If somebody... Uh, squats they in a mooring. Should, they, if they squat in a mooring, should, and if mooring smart, which most boaters typically are because it's gold real estate, they're going to know that right now, if the, if the year is 2024, but it's got a 2020 sticker on it, you better be careful because it's not inspected. And it also gives the harbor master the opportunity to see which ones are inspected and which ones aren't. We so know who's not inspected about, and who. But Brad, we know who's inspected. Okay. The boats we, that break off the moorings are typically uninspected, broken down moorings. So uh, I'm not Brad, trying to Brad, create a yeah. We know what in, moorings are inspected, and if moorings aren't inspected, we notify the mooring companies, and the mooring companies know whose moorings are inspected. And we, when we send out the mooring renewal bills, 
it actually has the inspection date on the bill if it's due. Well, you know what? The, the bad guys that don't inspect, uh, I propose that this is a 20 cent solution to keep people, uh, you know, I would say well, What do official. you do if somebody jumps on your mooring? Kick what do you off. do then? Like, Mike? kick them off. But kick them off. I, nobody knows how to get a hold of them because they're just, it, it, you know, you call, I, I look up in the, um, the Environmental Police the website number. and yep. it gives me a telephone number that's been disconnected two years ago. One second, guys. Let, let me just throw in something else here. And Brad, I appreciate these are, your- These are your, other people's, Brad, these are other people's property hmm. that you're just going to allow anybody to use. They, what they should uh, be doing- it's, That's not it, the goal. If somebody, the, needs, the, if somebody needs mooring, then they should contact us or maybe, you know, the yacht club who has a half dozen moorings or the boat club that has a half dozen moorings or maybe, you know, some, the yacht club may have some of their um, mooring, um, mer, their yacht club members that have moorings that aren't being used. But guys, let me just throw in one more thing here. I hear Can you. I just say one thing? I've seen a lot of damage. That's all. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Well, this, and Brad, I appreciate your your efforts, but I think it's a a more global goal that you. I think you're aiming at not just for these storm issues. It's just a visual representation on the ball that the inspection has happened. And I, Steve, I know you have it in your in your files, and yet you know. And the mooring guys report to you, and the owners report to and you, the, and you have the date. And the sticker, the sticker that you put on the boat also has that it's been inspected. On the boat. Your the boat. Your boat. Yeah. We give you a mooring sticker, and it gives you an inspection date. Right. And it's on and the it, sticker. And it's and your that, boat that belongs on that mooring, not somebody else's. Right. So everybody doesn't use their, moor, their moorings, you know, for seven months during the year. And I think Brad and Brad, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I thought a visual um, notification on the ball or on the shackle or somewhere on it, a maybe a um, some sort of uh, a wire tie, a big you know one inch wide wire tie or something on it, saying the date on it may just give um, even the mooring guys when they're going to put somebody on the on the ball for a. Uh, a transient situation, just as a reminder or something that it's been inspected um, versus That's just it. a storm issue that Brad. Well, gentlemen. Yeah, let, exactly. Let me, but just, let me try to say something here, Brad, and or let me yeah. inject something here, please. Um, Brad, God bless you, man. You got a bone in your teeth because you, you, you got on this and you went out and you did all the legwork, which is um, admirable for trying to come up with a solution. And uh, but we're mixing two, two, two things here. Number one is policy and number two is implementation. Brad came up with some interesting ideas that would probably work for implementation, but of a policy that we haven't discussed yet or figured out if we want to do it. Namely, as Friedman just said, do we want to have an additional marking on the mooring saying that it has been inspected? Now, if we do that, if we decide that we want to have some additional marking, then we can get into stickers or wire ties and all that stuff. We don't need to discuss that yet, despite Brad's work on it, until we figure out if we want to have additional marking on the morning saying it's been certified. It's been inspected. I would put forth that the mooring is there, so therefore it's inspected. And if it's not inspected, we hold the harbor master accountable for allowing a mooring to be out there without its inspection being up to date. As the, as the harbor master just said, you got a sticker on your boat, your boat's on your mooring. You only get that sticker, as we know, by documenting that that mooring is inspected. Now, we also are aware that occasionally some things fall through the cracks and there are problems with um, boats breaking free, moorings failing, and so on. But that's not a sticker or a wire tie that's going to solve that problem. The problem is, is we just need to beef up our accountability of Steve holding the mooring people um, 
you know, to having to having their moorings be inspected. Personally, I think the fact that we have so very few accidents to test that our mooring inspection program is working very well. I'm sure that we can do better. And I'm also sure that the Harbor Master is trying to do better. But I don't see how adding a sticker or a wire tire, some visual marking on the mooring is going to change anything significantly because the fact that the mooring is there, only moorings that are inspected should be there, period. So if there's a ball on it, it has to be inspected. And if it's not inspected, out it comes. That is all perfectly said, Rick. I 100% agree with you. I'd be interested to see if uh, Harvester Moan could take a look at this year as to not to add another thing to his plate of things to do, but how many moorings that are supposed to be inspected right now aren't inspected and it's December or November. So that's the better way to they fix won't get it. a sticker, right? I mean, I mean, can I, uh, I know I go down and I make sure I have my inspection and, you know, to be honest with you one time, don't tell anybody other than all of our friends here right now and, and Alicia taking minutes, but I forgot my, ins I forgot to have my uh, inspection thing taken care of. And Steve said, Nope, you forgot that Send it back. And uh, so, you know, it, it was all done. Um, so I, I this think year is the first year we didn't give stickers out because of COVID. Yeah. yeah. That was, other than that, Ellen fills out. If you don't have a sticker or if you're not inspected, you don't get a sticker. So I think maybe we, you know, we can ask the Harbor master to, you know, reaffirm the, or we reaffirm with the Harbor master, the importance mm -hmm. of, um, the sticker program and the having the moorings be inspected and that we back him should he deny someone putting their boat on a mooring because the mooring hasn't been inspected. And I think if we pledge to, if we pledge to hold ourselves accountable to the Harbor master that we will support him if he whacks somebody for it, then uh, that should also uh, back him for uh, doing what he needs to do, which he seems to be doing. Yeah, I think that's a good approach, Rick. A good um, idea, Rick. Yeah. Um, and, and Brad, I I, under, I do understand, and I applaud you for trying to, you know, look at different ways of doing it. But I also, you know, you know, these are the moorings are other people's property. So I'm just concerned that, you know, during certain events. You put a sticker on that says it's good to go. Somebody else is going to use it, and it's yours. You may not want somebody on your mooring. I understand. It's not. It's not. It's not a. It's honestly not a free for all out there. If somebody calls, it is. Need a mooring. You gotta see it. They can. They can call me. They can call her off. Yeah. Okay. Because if you put your boat on a it's got a black sticker and you're like, oh, my boat will fit here. 25 foot mooring or a 20 foot mooring. Maybe it'll drag during the storm. Yeah. That's a good yeah. point. It's an interesting issue. Can I try Thanks, everybody. As a, uh, as a um, yeah, owner and, and, the a, mooring inspection. and a mooring service uh, company and whatever else I want to come under. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the, the process over the years that I've been involved in has, is, is, is continuously evolving. Um, we've gone from a five-year inspection to a three-year inspection. We've gone through any kind of changes on that. It's, it's um, weather sensitive, it's tide sensitive, it's time sensitive in order to try to get all these things done. And, and Stephen, you know, I've had conversation with you about how, how specifically should inspections be to the day or to the year or to the month or however that goes. And we've got, we're trying to work on, on how to get that squared away. Number one, uh, number two, no one, but the boat owner registered to that mooring should be on it period without the consent of the mooring owner and the Harbor master. Those are, I think those are the rules of regulations. Um, um, and that's, and, and that's, in, that's important. Um, if we went to that system, I would put an old sticker on my moorings so no one would use it. You know, it's just, I, I don't want to be responsible. As the mooring service provider, 
I'm indemnified by another boat being put on a mooring in case it comes off. And but uh, along with that, every boat's supposed to have insurance. And we know that people get insurance and then cancel it after they get their sticker. And these are the things that go on. And there should be maybe some sort of indemnification that they sign rather than provide documentation. They sign and say, we, we, we say we have it. And if they don't, then they're responsible and they lose their mooring. And lastly, just a case in point, somebody was in the harbor in a 45 or a 50 foot catamaran and that mooring and that wind the other day dragged it right across the channel. It was it was completely across the channel on Sunday trying to go out. So Correct. case in point. They shouldn't be they shouldn't be using them. They shouldn't it shouldn't be like that. I understand the inspection process. It's always evolving and as far as an inspection goes, it the way I go at it, the inspection is only good the day I do it. Just like having your David, car inspected and you drive out and your headlight fails. Okay. David, yeah. you and I have been talking about having it so that it lands on, you know, it has to be. It, it just gives you a window of, to do it. Everything is, I got to be It should be August. February. It's got to be done by August 1st, all the inspections in that year. Yeah. You know, yeah. so you, you're not worried about, well, this one's got to be done by, but, you know, June 20th and this one's, you know, July 2nd. Yeah. And, Exactly, or February or March in, in or a April, year. You can only get three done with a diver because the water is freaking so cold. Yeah. So there's, there's other there's other hurdles that are going. I understand where where Brad's coming from, but I I don't I don't approve of anyone using any mooring that I've inspected with another boat that doesn't been approved by the harbor master. And I do understand where Brad. I understand where Brad's coming from as well, but I I agree with you, David, that. You know, it, it's it's inspected for that particular boat. You put a forty Unless, foot boat on there that weighs thirty tons of displaces has a thirty ton displacement on a mooring that has the same size boat that has a, a quarter of that. It's a whole different setup. It's just it's just not it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And I just I don't want to I don't think I think we're all in some thing, agreement. I think we're all in somewhat agreement here that yeah, we appreciate yeah. Brad's homework on bringing this up and having our discussion about it. Yeah, Thank, thanks Brad for the homework on that. I know you, you spent some time doing that and getting that information together. It sounds like uh, we're still kind of looking whether there's a need there or not. And that really kind of falls back to Stephen and the inspection guys to see uh, kind of if they feel that's really needed. Yeah, it's a stop. And, you know, as they say in organizational behavior, the fish stinks from the head first. And if we can make sure that the uh, boat owners and the mooring owners are getting their inspections like they're supposed to, then it shouldn't be a problem. Right. So, uh, yeah. thanks. All right. Um, we are at the end of the agenda. I know you guys are probably disappointed. You probably wanted to stay on a little bit longer. <laughs> Yeah. Move to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Second the motion. <laughs> Thank you all. I didn't even know how he was. I didn't even know how he was here. He was so quiet. Oh, now he's here. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Good night, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen.